This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to Derek Jensen, he's been described as the poet-philosopher of the ecology movement. Derek Jensen has written some 15 books critiquing contemporary society and the destruction of the environment. In 2008, he was named one of Utney Reader magazine's 50 visionaries who are changing the world. Among his books, A Language Older Than Words, Endgame, what we left behind, and resistance against empire. Derek Jensen lives in Northern California. I had an extended conversation with him in San Francisco and began by asking him to explain the title of his latest book, what he means by deep green resistance. I think a lot of us are increasingly recognizing that the dominant culture is killing the planet. And we can argue about whether, you know, there will be a few bacteria left or whatever, but when 90 percent of the large fish in the oceans are gone, when there's six to ten times as much plastic as phytoplankton in parts of the ocean, when there's dioxin in every mother's breast milk, when um, background rates or uh, rates of extinction are a thousand to ten thousand times background rates, you know, it's, it's sort of just playing with numbers to talk about whether it's killing the planet or simply mortally wounding it. And, um, and I think it's very important for us to start to build a culture of resistance, because what we're doing isn't working, clearly. Um, I ask a lot of times why it is that environmentalists, as environmentalists, I include myself as a frontline activist, I ask why it is that we lose so often. And there's a couple of answers that that really speak to me. And one of them is that I think a lot of us don't really know what it is we want, and we don't think strategically very much. It's like, so what do you want? So I don't think I don't think that a lot of us think very clearly about what it is exactly we want. And I mean I do know what I want, which is I want to live in a world that has more wild salmon every year than the year before, and I want to live in a world that has less dioxin in every mother's breast milk every year than the year before in a world that has more migratory songbirds every year than the year before. And that's part of, part of one of the, things, the reasons I think that a lot of times we, we don't win is, once again, I'm not sure that a lot of us know what we want. And then another problem is that there's this absolutely extraordinary book called The Nazi Doctors by Robert J. Lifton. And in this book, he describes how it was that men, people, that men in this case, who had taken the Hippocratic Oath could work in Nazi death camps. And what he found was that many of the, the doctors who worked in the death camps actually cared very deeply for the health of the inmates. And, you know, Mengele was, you know, horrible. And, but, but a lot of the sort of straight-line doctors were just, they would do whatever they could. They would give them an extra scrap of potato to eat, or the, the inmates, or they would hide them from the selection officer who were going to kill them, or they would... To keep their experiments going? No, no, no. They would hide them from the selection officer who were going to kill them. Mm -hmm. They would do this to protect the inmate for, for that. They would, they would put them to bed, you know. They would actually do everything. If they were in pain, they would give them an aspirin to lick. They would do what they could to help, except for the most important thing of all, which is they wouldn't question the existence of the entire death camp itself. So they would find themselves working within the rules, however they could, to try to improve conditions marginally. Um, and in retrospect, of course, that's just not sufficient. And as a longtime activist, I see myself and other activists doing the same thing, that what we do is um, we do everything that is um, allowed by those in power to uh, attempt to stop their destruction. But the problem is, whenever we figure out a way to use their rules to actually stop them, they change the rules. Derek Jensen, deep green resistance, what form should it take? Sometimes I get accused of being the violence guy because I talk about capital F fighting back. But I don't ever think that's really fair because 
I really consider myself the everything guy, that I want to put everything on the table and talk about um, you know, all forms of resistance and decide whether they're appropriate or inappropriate for, for use. I, I don't want to go in pre, pre-judging. Um, I think, uh, for example, one man all by himself almost stopped World War II, George Elser. Uh, he was a trade unionist who didn't like what Hitler was doing to the trade unions. So he got a job in a mine, stole some explosives, and uh, he knew every year uh, on the anniversary of the beer hall putsch that uh, Hitler would give a speech and from 7.30 to 8.30. So he set a bomb to go off at 8.20, 1939. And uh, unfortunately, because of the weather, uh, Hitler gave his speech from 7 to 8 and left 20 minutes early. And um, so my point is, I think that in that case, you know, and we can certainly parse out cases where we think it's appropriate to have militant response or non-militant response. But something I want to say about all that is that that's not the real question for me. The real question is the distinction between those people who do something and those people who do nothing. And um, and I want to emphasize, too, that, that, for example, even the IRA at its strongest, or the U.S. military for that matter, only about 2% of the people ever pick up weapons. Most of the people are doing support work. I mean, Mod Gun was, excuse me, Mod Gun was a, um, was central to the uh, Gaelic literature revival. She wrote plays and she sang, and her son became the uh, uh, chief of staff of the IRA and later formed Amnesty International. And there's this, uh, I guess all I'm trying to say is that we need to ask ourselves, what do we want? and then to ask ourselves, how are we going to get there? And those are not real rhetorical questions. I mean, there is an easy resorting to violence. I think it's the comes from the model of the establishment. Um, they like to say war is the last resort, but so often it is the first approach that the uh, establishment takes, uh, led by the military, and sometimes not led by. They're the ones that know the suffering the most, so it'll just be the civilian government. But do you want to take that model um, of violence as a way, even a way to deal? I mean, imagine if you took violence off the table. You didn't justify the violence the establishment was doing um, by saying, or you didn't answer it by saying, they're doing violence, so it has to be met with violence. Uh, I mean, you, you, from your life, you talk a great deal about your own growing up and the role that violence played and how incredibly destructive it was. Why don't we go there? Why don't you talk about how you came to be Derek Jensen? Um, what has shaped you, influenced you, both negatively and positively? But this issue of violence that is so real, unfortunately, not a metaphor in your life. Um, well, yeah. My father is extremely violent, um, was, presumably still is. I haven't talked to him for years. And um, he broke my sister's arm. My uh, brother has epilepsy from blows to the head. He um, raped my mother, my sister, and me. And um, that one of the things that that and we can talk about the negative effects of that, you know, many years of therapy, and we can talk about, you know, the years of insomnia and the night terrors and all that. Um, but I think the central way, there are a few people, I know you're not saying this, there are a few people who say, gosh, he just wants to fight back because he's projecting his own, um, you know, helplessness as a child onto the larger culture. You know, he, he, he hates the, the big daddy now, you know, the Uncle Sam daddy. And once again, I'm not suggesting or suggesting that. And that's always been sort of a kind of a ridiculous critique, I've thought, because if my father would have been perfect, 90% of the large fish in the oceans would still be gone. And uh, Coca-Cola would still be um, destroying aquifers in India. And 25% um, of all women in this culture would still be getting raped. And you know, we could go all down the list. That, that, but one of the things that he, that 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 did do, is it um, it helped me understand. 
it helped me get a framework on which I could start to understand the larger uh, movements of power in the culture and also the, the larger ways that discourse supports power. We'll continue with Derek Jensen in a minute, author, activist. He's been called the poet-philosopher of the ecology movement. If you'd like a copy of our show, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Back in a minute. How is it we are here on this path we walk? Was fear filled with empty talk? Descending from the end, the scientists please all think. Will they save us in the end? We're trembling on the brink. 